Being seven o'clock. Being seven o'clock, we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Bosmus. Here. Commissioner Baker. Here. Commissioner Collins. Here. Commissioner Gary. Here. Commissioner Miller. Here. Commissioner Talentino. Here. Commissioner Torty. Here. Okay, we're all here. Please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. I would ask those with uh, cell phones if you would please put them on vibrate or silence them by turning them off. We would appreciate it. We'd also like to welcome the uh, Youth Advisory Council from Council members from the Chippewa County Community Foundation. Um, they have some items. Uh, they have an item on the agenda later on that uh, be presented by uh, someone here in the, on the commission. And also, uh, the Community Foundation is uh, director is here. Uh, Debbie Jones is also here. Okay, with that uh, roll, uh, let's see. We're going to B, proclamations and recognitions. We have none at this time. So, in the public comment, there are public comment on scheduled agenda items. Any time at this time, a person may reserve time to speak on an agenda item not to exceed three minutes per person. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on an agenda item? We have Caitlin and Jay in the back, and you will give it an opportunity at the time we have the um, status report, okay? Uh, anyone else? If not, we'll go to the consent agenda. Uh, Deputy City Manager. Under the consent agenda, one, approval of the City Commission meeting minutes of December 3rd, 2018. Item two, acceptance of the Airport Advisory Board meeting minutes of November 8th. Item three, acceptance of the Community Services Board meeting minutes of November 28th. Item four, acceptance of the Economic Development Board meeting minutes of November 13th. Item five is approval of the MERS Healthcare Savings Program Participation Agreement for the Clerical Unit, Non-Union, and Department Heads. Item six, approval of the 2019 Part-Time Seasonal Wage Schedule. Item 7, scheduling of a public hearing for the CDBG funding relative to the rental rehabilitation project involving 221 and 223 West Portage Avenue, the Kalia properties. Item 8 is from Chippewa County, county tax foreclosures. Item 9 is from Daniel Possumai and Lori McDonald, re uh, request to release lien on parcel number 051-864. Dash zero zero eight dash zero zero, and item ten is approval of the consent agenda items as presented. Okay, thank you. Is there a commissioner that like something further explained on the consent agenda? Okay, let's go to Commissioner Collins. Motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented. Support. Support. It's been moved and supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Bospis. Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item E, special orders of business. One, annual audit presentation for the year ending June 30, 2018. Okay, thank you. Uh, City Manager Turner. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Ken Talisman with the Anderson Tackman is here this evening to present uh, the fiscal year 18 audit to the city commission and community. Okay. Ken. Good evening. Good evening. Thank the mayor and city commission for having me here to present the 2018 financial audit. The city of Sault Ste. Marie, like so many other cities and uh, counties and townships and villages, has to have an audit annually to meet the requirements of the state of Michigan. Uh, as far as an accounting of all their assets and obligations and revenues and expenses and fund balances and make sure everything is captured accurately with the proper internal controls as well as making sure there's evidence to supporting the financials uh, as far as uh, <laughs> what you have for cash and, and the obligations for debt and all those things. And some of the things we do usually are uh, confirmation with the individual institutions that you have cash with and investments as well as the different institutions that you owe obligations of debt to. So we'll confirm that directly with them and, and confirm that with them. 
to make sure that everything's accurate. And there's a lot of other things we do with uh, transaction testing and uh, looking at a lot of vouching of information to make sure that we have something to hang our hat on at the end of the day with the financials to know that you're able to put some together accurately and as well as, as what you're showing everybody in the public is, is accurate and can be relied upon. So at the end of all that, we give our opinion on the financial statements and that's on uh, page two, the second page of our letter. And we give, can possibly give four. There's the adverse, what it means when we've got through the audit and done all of our testing and, and uh, found that there's discrepancies that cannot be resolved. That's an adverse opinion. That's the, the, the one you don't want. There's also a disclaimer when there isn't information uh, to support the numbers and, or there's for unknown reasons we can't uh, support some of these things. And then there's a modified, which pretty much means everything's okay except for maybe an item or area two are weak, but uh, largely maybe 90% of everything else is, is fine. That's a modified. Then the remainder is the unmodified, which means as far as is uh, accuracy of the statements as well as following the different accounting and auditing rules, everything was done in compliance with that and, and that you're following the you know, different uh, principles, accounting principles and standards. Uh, without any exceptions. So the city received the unmodified opinion for, uh, again, for 2018. The next thing uh, we look into are we brought, a, uh, again, a packet of graphs to show how the financials um, turned out for 2018. In the first graph, uh, usually we show the uh, assets of the, of the uh, city and combined. Am I doing my own presentation? Clicking. All right, so the first pie graph shows all the assets of the city. Like most cities, most of your assets are tied up in capital assets, all the infrastructure, like the streets, water and sewer systems, uh, sidewalks and things, uh, as well as the different trucks and uh, graders and dump trucks and <clears throat> vehicles and such. Then the next area we have deferred outflows resources, which is a, kind of like a deferred loss, which ties in with the pension reporting that's required now. With, uh, I think we're in the fourth year of having to report pension obligations. And with that, there's uh, kind of a snapshot in how the plans are doing at this point in time, which is your year end of June 30, of uh, comparing the assets in the plan versus the present value of the obligations of the plan. And that liability now is put on your, your combined balance sheet. And with that, we have certain deferred outflows, which are kind of like losses, and deferred inflows, which are like gains that are, uh, determined by the actuarial companies, which uh, MERS has their own, and then the police and firemen also have their own, and they will amortize those over time, uh, anywhere ranging from you know three to five to seven years against that obligation and, and write those off. Next, you have cash and equivalents, about 9.5 million, and you have cash that's restricted, 3.6, and you have restricted cash for things such as uh, debt covenants. Uh, you have investments that are restricted also for debt covenants in the water and sewer. You have receivables for uh, the different uh, water and sewer uh, fees that are uncollected into the year, and you also have taxes receivable. Uh, you have special assessments for the different uh, sidewalk and different projects done as they are uh, paid over 10 years, and we have other things like inventories and prepaids. Next, we have the uh, obligations of the city, which are the liabilities or the net position. And starting over on the left, we have compensated absences, which is employee sick and vacation time. Again, those deferred inflows, which are like a deferred gain written off over time. We have investment capital assets, which is your kind of your fund balance and your capital assets net of debt. And then we have uh, restricted for, for trust of 7.6, uh, unrestricted and negative on uh, 9, which is negative mostly because of the advent of the pension reporting from, that came about four years ago. Uh, and that's pretty much affected most governments of having to record such a big obligation all of a sudden. Then we have accounts payable, uh, bonds payable, all your different obligations. And the pension liability between the two plans is about 25 million. Next we have the 
revenues of the government funds, which the big ones are the general fund as well as the major local streets, all the special revenue funds. And uh, the lion's share of the revenues for the city, like most cities, is taxes. And that was a little bit better uh, than last year. We landed about $7.3 million for property taxes. The special assessment revenue stayed pretty even. Uh, licenses and permits, uh, revenue was down to 30. Uh, federal also down. State sources went up quite a bit. We had uh, about 500000 more in street fund monies this year compared to 2017, so that did better. I think the general fund got about 170,000 more in state grants than last year, and then the, the remainder, about 1.2 million, were just in the different capital project funds uh, that happened in 2018 that were funded by additional state funding and, uh, and those things. Local revenues, uh, pretty comparable. Charges for services, which are the different fees charged at the departments of the city. Rentals, pretty even. Interest earnings and other revenue also, pretty comparable. Then you have the expenses of those government funds, uh, broken into the areas of legislative, which is the council, or city commission, uh, general government, which includes things like the treasurer, the clerk, uh, elections, uh, building and grounds, uh, public safety, which includes the police and fire, uh, public works, which uh, encompasses like uh, DPW and the major and local streets, health and welfare, which largely is the ambulance operations, that landed about 1.2 million, pretty close to last year. Uh, Rec and Culture, which is the parks, uh, different stadiums like the Polar Stadium. Uh, capital and the <clears throat> capital outlay was about 2.3 million. Again, we had uh, quite a bit more state funding in 2018, and again, that went towards different capital uh, infrastructure uh, for the city this year. And debt service was also uh, about 522,000, which is principal and interest on the general debt of the city, and then other expenditures about 300,000. We also have a graph showing the revenues of the water and sewer operations. Uh, that was about, landed about 7.1 million from last year. Uh, other revenues and interest income also comparable. The next graph shows the expenses of water and sewer. Uh, those, most notably the personnel, which is the different uh, salaries and, and fringes of the employees of the water and sewer departments was a little bit lower about 1.7 million compared to 1.9. Uh, supplies were down, the contractor services stayed pretty level, insurance, utilities, uh, repairs and maintenance on the system also uh, pretty level, rental expenses. Depreciation is the depreciation of all the capital assets like the infrastructure and different uh, pumps and equipment for the water and sewer was up a bit from about 1.5 to 1.6. And interest expense was down 938,000 last year, but 982 this year for the payment of the debt on the water and sewer system. Again, most cities have a lot of debt on their water and sewer system because it's such a big uh, infrastructure item. It's hard unless it gets donated, like in the uh, community of Kenrose Township when the military left and they just gave it away. Most well, cities have to pay a lot of uh, special assessments, debt, just to get those uh, constructed and keep them keep them moving. So there's always a lot of uh, bond and interest that goes in the uh, upkeep and, and maintenance of those water and sewer systems. Then other expenses was about a million for the water and sewer fund. Uh, page eight is the five-year trend of the fund balance of the general fund. Uh, this year we had a little bit more of an upswing again. About, I went from about almost 2.9 million in 17 to about 3.2. Uh, so you've gained a little bit. I think in the budget, I think we're anticipating to go a little bit lower with the way things turned out. I think, you know, maybe pushing off some capital projects until next year uh, led to kind of ending the year a little bit stronger than anticipated. And you're still about in your in your uh, plan for your uh, fund, maintaining a fund balance. I think usually the, the state finance officers uh, administration has like a 10 to 15 percent floor that they always recommend for cities to not fall underneath so, so you're in a safe place for you know whatever reasons that you've got uh, money for in case there's reductions in funding by the state or federal government as well as uh, um, any type of uh, disaster or, or shortage of, uh, of anything so you have kind of a cushion. So again you've, you've uh, landed I think in a safe place yeah. for, for 2018. Uh, Ken? Excuse me. Yes. Uh, uh, Commissioner Collins has a question. Sure. Ken, can you just explain um, how fund balances occur? 
just for basic sure. audiences. I used to get a lot yeah. of questions on that, and that yep. seems to be the one that kind of is right. out there. Yeah, that's a good question. So fund balance is kind of like the res like what's left over each year of your operations. You as you end the year, you either uh, have a have a, a kind of a profit or a loss. And that kind of accumulates in this fund balance account each year. So as long as the city's been in operation for you know, however long, it's had some years it may it, it added and some years it decreased. But fund balance is the accumulation of all those years of surpluses and losses. And that's kind of your uh, what you have to as part of your budget each year to work with besides whatever you're planning to get for current year revenues and current year anticipated expenditures. So it's kind of your your uh, your working surplus or loss as some some cities have but in your case it's to the better and this is just a comment to the um, the city commission um, several years ago ended up having a motion uh, in a decided that we would have wanted at least a 20 percent mm -hmm. uh, over the to maintain a 20 percent yearly right and if we could increase it we would do that uh, knowing that we have some lean years and some um, so that I see at this point it, it continues to uh, increase at this point. So, right. and then this year could be good, but next year the city manager kind of will fill us in a little bit later and where, right. where that might go. You know, so it'll be a little leaner next year. Right. That's just a comment. Uh, another thing that's been occurring with the state of Michigan, uh, they have a, an ability now to track uh, government's uh, current year general fund revenues and their expenditures. And if you have three years in a row, a row that you have shortfalls meaning your your revenues are higher than your expenditures they'll send you a letter saying you know you, you're worrying that you're maybe in financial distress what's going on and they'll ask the, the city manager or whoever to respond with you know what they're going through and what you're planning to do differently so i don't know with uh with what's happened in some governments that they've had to turn turn them over to uh whatever the financial administrators i think they're that's their effort to try to get ahead of that and kind of watch people so that's occurring in some governments that they're they're doing that now and, and giving uh, governments the kind of the feeling that hey we're watching and, and uh, seeing what's going on with you and, and uh, trying to head off some of these problems as they occur but so it's like it's a good thing to just kind of uh, think you with your fund balance you have years that you kind of build it up and you have years that you know that you're going to have you know leaner years or you need to spend that money for certain things so it kind of, it's kind of cyclical and that's and that's kind of the way it should be okay thank you the next graph on page nine shows the taxable values again it's pretty staying pretty even in the different areas of commercial industrial residential agriculture and utility uh, not any two uh two big increases in the in the tax base there and I think uh, the last graph shows the revenue sharing, which is a big ticket item for revenues for cities. Uh, this year we did a little bit better than last. I think you had about a million five forty-seven in revenue sharing in seventeen, and we're at about one million six hundred two and eighteen, so a little under fifty thousand uh, gain for revenue sharing. And again, with that, they still make you do quite a bit of uh, work, jumping through a lot of hoops as far as the reporting that. That the administration of the city is required to do to provide a lot of financial information on the state's website with different financial indicators of how you guys are doing and a lot of information a lot of information goes into that reporting there's a lot of quite a bit a lot of work for the people that have to do it so that's seems to be doing uh doing well like as far for the city it seems like you're pro providing everything that you have to and letting them letting them know all the information so that you're able to maximize the revenue sharing and that's a good thing just a comment on the 10 years revenue sharing trend. In 2009, we got a million six twenty-two, million six hundred thousand twenty-two, uh, and some change. And almost 10 years later, we're at a million six hundred and two. So we're still twenty thousand below what it was in, in 2009. So it's, right. when you look in, inflation to a, into account, it's a, it's a tremendous loss for the city yeah. um, over those years, and we'll never make it up. But um, right. We, I know every uh, every year we mention that as a as a need when going forward, and once in a while we get a little more than we think we're going to get, but right. it's um, it, it's certainly uh, not enough. And I think the other thing that was hard during that period of time is it seemed like they they pushed a lot more mandate like uh, mandated services that weren't funded too at a lot of governments. So mm -hmm. not only were you losing money, but they were expecting more. What you did get. 
I think otherwise, uh, I think financially, I think you know, you guys aren't doing. Uh, you always had a pretty good, stable year. I think you made some modest gains in, in uh, different areas. Uh, pay down, pay down your debt. Uh, the uh, pension plans. Let's see, that's always a good topic with you guys. You have obviously the two different plans. You have uh, the MERS plan, uh, which went down about nine hundred nineteen thousand. It landed about a nine million dollar liability. That's on page fifty four of the report itself. And then on. Page 58, it shows the uh, uh, police and fire too, and that's at about 16 million. And kind of the takeaway with these pension plans and this this reporting of the liability, uh, I think when the Gasby settled to do this, they just wanted to kind of keep, keep this in front of you so that you're thinking about these numbers and where you're at at any point in time. So I know when the when the city of Detroit had all their problems and they wanted to know well what's what's in our what are we obligated for the pension plan? What do we what do we need? And what do we have? With that, all this stuff, they had really no idea. And I think that wasn't the only reason the guys we did these things, but they wanted to have more of a um, an accounting of this and to have a, a realistic picture of where you were at any time, so you kind of could plan and and react more uh, more better uh, and not just be caught off guard. And the, the other takeaway I keep telling a lot of governments is it's not a requirement that you be totally funded. I mean, you realistically, you look at your employee mix. You have a lot of people uh, working, a couple hundred people at the city. Not everybody's going to retire tomorrow. There's some people that are brand new, some people uh, 10 years in, five years, you know, 15. So it's staggered. And it's kind of something that I think you just got to manage. You got to make sure that you're keeping it funded enough uh, to a, a good enough level to make sure you're meeting your obligations as they come due. The truth is, it isn't 100% due, but at uh, maybe a maybe a more realistic number is maybe between 60 and 70 percent having that that on hand is is a, a better place to be thank you thank you Ken uh, Commissioner Twardy so if I was going to ask the uh, the question the build-in question then I have a follow-up question sure. what would you give us as a rating then I'd give it a this year given an a and is part of that reasoning now because of the um, the reporting from the pension funding system that has that brought us down just a little Bit. It brought it brought you guys down. It brought well. Truth is, it brought everybody down. Mm -hmm. Unless they didn't. Unless they didn't have a defined benefit plan. Okay. Some had already switched to defined contribution plans, like the state of Michigan did, you know, put a while ago. But however, that A rating, um, when we had to, uh, when the city manager and then uh, Kristen Collins had to sit down and and uh, create our longevity plan for how we were going to remedy our underfunded status, mm -hmm. that A rating, I'm sure, helps out in that report and helps keep the city or the state maybe from paying atten too close attention to right. our unfunded. Right, because they are, that's the other thing, they are watching now and they're, not that they can make you do anything, but they'll, you know, push a lot of letters at you and ask you to write letters back and, and you know, so a lot, again, a lot more work for administration to talk about these things and, and make them feel better at the end of the day, so. Okay, okay. thank you. Any other questions? Uh, City Manager Turner. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I appreciate the presentation from Mr. Talsma. As the Mayor mentioned earlier, um, we have seen an increase in the general fund ratio uh, from the close of fiscal year 17, which it stood at roughly 25.6%. Uh, saw that ratio increase for the general fund of 28.31% for uh, expenses. And right now we're currently anticipating that because of issues like uh, the refund with the Michigan Tax Tribunal settlement with Cascade Crossings and some uh, potentially lower than anticipated state funding sources and uh, accrued labor costs which will be paid out with settlement of uh, collective bargaining agreements that we'll see that dip down a bit uh, for the next fiscal year, but we are I think I'm very confident in this uh, In the trend in which the city is going and I would anticipate that a minimum balance ratio of approximately 23 to 24 percent I think is reasonable once you control for those uh, Different kinds of considerations, which is right in line with the past three to four years uh, very pleased with the work that the department heads, the finance director, the finance department staff have done not only in regards to uh, the day-to-day -day management of fiscal resources, but also with the presence of internal controls, 
within departments to make sure that resources are protect protected and used as wisely as possible. Uh, certainly a team effort and one of the comments that we've been discussing internally is perhaps after the six month budget review or during the budget development cycle, taking a look at what amount may be additionally contributed to pension funds. Uh, one of the considerations that the state of Michigan takes into account uh, when we are discussing our pension plan funding is if additional contributions are being made. So certainly something that may come back in front of the city commission in the future. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gary. I make a motion to accept the audited financial statements of the city of Sault Ste. Marie for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2018 as presented by Anderson Tackman and company PLC. Support. It's been moved forward. Are there any questions? Comments? Just a comment on, be on behalf of the city commission, I'd certainly like to thank uh, Ken Talsman and his corporation certainly in doing the audit and again the city administration, city employees, mm -hmm. um, taxpayers. Um, it, it, it's a huge circle. Uh, everybody has to contribute and mm -hmm. certainly writing grants and uh, mm -hmm. being a recipient of some of those kind of grants uh, certainly helps all the, all the things that we try to do as a city and services that we try to provide. So uh, it was a, it's been a good year and we look for a continuing good year in the, in the new year. So on behalf of the city, thank you uh, very much, everybody. Okay. I'd like to thank everybody at the city too for all their hard work and pulling all the information together. And uh, we send a lot of things ahead of time to get uh, pulled and looked at. And then too, we have to kind of use the element of surprise because of the rules of auditing and, and look at things, you know, not always the same things and move around. So everybody is very timely and very cooperative and we, we appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a motion and support. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Baker. Yes. Commissioner Collins. Yes. Commissioner Gary. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Torty? Yes. Mayor Bospis? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Item F, communications. One from Commissioner Baker. Discussion regarding goal setting and budget session. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Baker? We can pull that off the agenda for tonight. Okay. And that was just to, uh, during the uh, goal setting, uh, uh, we'll have that uh, um, recorded and then it'll be put on the uh, city's website after for people that would like to at least look at that okay and number two thank you item on number two under communications is from commissioner gary discussion on medical marijuana licensing research okay thank you uh, commissioner gary uh included in your packet were uh several different uh, articles and and copies of the law uh, in regard to medical marijuana and over the last two meetings, we've discussed recreational marijuana at length, and, and we've had some discussions on medicinal marijuana as well. As we all know, the state has until December 6, 2019 to establish rules, and uh, no licenses will be granted prior to recreational, prior for recreational. <coughs> the Medical Marijuana Act was uh, passed in 2008, and it made it legal for qualifying patients to possess and caregivers to grow. In the Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act, which was passed by the Michigan Legislature in 2016 to license and regulate medical marijuana growers, processors, provisioning centers, transporters, and safety compliance facilities, and to provide powers and duties to state and local government officers and entities, uh, and that was passed in 2016. Subsequently, no rules were issued uh, by the state and emergency rules had to be created, uh, which have a six month expiration. So they're set to expire uh, soon, so they could very well change. Uh, through our discussions and input, uh, I, I think it appears like uh, we didn't dismiss the thought of medical marijuana. We opened to research the medical marijuana issues. And there was more support by electors. In, in 2008, the Medical Marijuana Act passed by 63% of the popular vote, 37 percent no. Uh, but then in 2018, the recreational vote was not quite as overwhelming. It only had 56 percent and 44 percent no. Uh, as you might have read in some of the articles, communities that have uh, opted in have done years of research and on how it impacts their unique community. And I know that Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario has, uh, has also worked on that, and they're still at kind of an impasse on on how the recreational will roll out. 
Uh, in the MML guide, which I thought was very interesting on medical marijuana facilities, opt-in or opt-out, uh, it points out that uh, there are a lot of arguments that have been made in favor of opting in, but it includes even stronger, uh, longer section on cautions and why you should be skeptical. And for example, they had federal law issues, costs, control, safety, and liability, uh, just to name a few of them. This is one issue uh, that's coming uh, across America, and it will require input from almost every department of the city. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. But every department and committee of the city will have to uh, review this information. So it's, it's something that we talked about earlier. It, it can't be taken lightly, and it, and it can't be uh, rushed along. When you think of the departments, uh, we're talking about the administration, the attorney, zoning, uh, planning and development, police and fire, finance, building department, planning commission, and, list goes, and the uh, city commission, and the list goes on and on. And uh, we establish goals every year, and we uh, pass those goals, and the city administration works on those goals. And in addition, at certain times, we have other initiatives that come up, and this year the rental property initiative has come up, the uh, MEDC uh, application, I think, for the big projects downtown, and of course the uh, carbide dock. And so some of those things add to the uh, administrative work burden, and uh, of course the uh, entire city work burden. Um, we also have uh, federal issues with a new attorney general. We don't know how he or she will interpret the law uh, and whether they will uh, enforce it. Uh, as uh, the articles have all said, there's no deadline for us to opt in and, and only 108 of the 1,700 communities within Michigan have at this point. Uh, so I think we all uh, kind of are looking for some more information. So I just wanted to bring this information to the commission, review it. I think in the last two um, agenda items that we've had on marijuana, there were over 26 articles and some were repeats, but there's, there are hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of pages of information that uh, has to be gleaned through. So uh, Mr. Mayor, what I'd like to do is make a motion that we refer medical marijuana facility licensing to our city administration to review state law, monitor rules, research peer communities best practices, and require a report due to the commission no later than December 6, 2019, and uh, to provide us quarterly updates to the commission uh, via the manager, city manager updates that he gives us so that we can monitor progress. Support. The move supported. Uh, any discussion? Commissioner Twardy. Thank you. I, uh, when Don told me he was putting this on the agenda, I was I was curious to see what he he was going to say. But I can tell you, over the last, even just since the last couple of meetings, um, in meeting people out in our community, and a lot of discussion, there's so much confusion with what is legal, what's not legal, what can people do, where can they do it. I think that it just shows um, cautious <coughs> leadership by sending it back for uh, a lot of research, a lot of looking into us. This law is not going anywhere. And, um, you know, I think it is a wave of the future for the country. So um, I commend Commissioner Geary for, again, all of his research, his thorough uh, presentations, and um, I also am in support of this. Uh, City Manager, do you have any comments? Uh, certainly administration will work uh, with every effort to meet this this motion uh, if it passes by the city commission and we look forward to um, performing that work okay any other questions uh, we have a motion to support uh, roll call please sorry just a second commissioner collins yes Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Torty? Yes. Mayor Bospis? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item number three is from Chippewa County Community Foundation Youth Advisory Committee Veterans Banner Initiative. Okay, who's uh, presenting? Um, Commissioner. <laughs> if you're going to present, you should. Yeah, that's. I was just going to excuse myself, and I'm saying. Okay. Please. I know you're 
You're part of the oh, not part on. of the group. Okay, I'm hoping not to do much talking tonight and let the kids talk. Um, but I'm just going to give you. Debbie, oh, if you'd introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry, Debbie appreciate. Jones, and I'm the executive director of the Chippewa County Community Foundation. And I'm just going to give you just a real quick um, history of Youth Advisory Council, or it's called YAC. Um, and back in 1999, the Community Foundation received quite a bit of money from the Kellogg Foundation to start what's called the YAC, Youth Advisory Council. And the purpose of that is for um, teaching, to, to make grants to. Um, projects in the um, in the community uh, that affect youth and the students get the opportunity to learn a lot about philanthropy about service work and about grant making um, we have at the community foundation an endowment fund that has a value of about four hundred thousand um, dollars we work with about twenty thousand annually to impact our community and so um, for the last five years, as I was the director of the, executive, or of the community foundation, I did run the YAC program as just another one of my functions. But um, it, just, it was time that we um, brought it to the next level. So a month ago, we did hire um, Commissioner Baker, Abby Baker, as our youth advisory council leader. Um, the, I had a new hashtag that was hashtag the speed of Abby, but the kids told me that they also have that same um, hashtag going because um, things have moved very very quickly with our YAC program program and I'm very excited about where it's going because not only is it um, active at Sioux High but now it's going to be active at Malcolm High School at Brimley High School hopefully we're going to be going into the Pickford High School um, there was there's a YAC at Rudyard that's going to get um, even more um, funding available to work too so really some great things are happening really quickly with our um, yak under the leadership of um, commissioner baker so one of the things that we started two years ago with our yak students is to take a service learning trip and um, it's a unique opportunity for these students to see another really another world another culture to realize that the world is a lot bigger than just Sault st marie two years ago we went to guatemala i took 16 kids to guatemala on a service learning trip and we worked at a school um they it was very eye-opening for them their school system is um absolutely nothing like our school system and uh this past summer in June, I took students to uh, the Dominican Republic. Um, Dominican Republic in June is very hot. Um, and the students, we, it was, that was a great trip. We built um, homes out of recycled bottles, plastic. And the kids worked so, so hard. Uh, we slept with nets around us because we had um, cockroaches and spiders. So the kids, um, learn a tremendous amount so this year the kids are starting to plan their trip and uh, it looks like it's probably going to be maybe Tanzania Tanzania with a water filtration project these trips are not cheap they're about two thousand to twenty five hundred dollars per student the students have to raise all of their own money to go on these trips nothing comes from our endowment fund nothing comes from the community foundations budget it's all self-funded through uh, fundraising activities so it started as a fundraising activity for our service learning trip um, that Abby's going to take the kids on this year um, which is good because I'm getting too old to do that um, it, it's morphed into something much bigger than just a fundraising trip um, and I am I am so excited about this and and I'm, as the kids talk about it please know that we don't have 100% of the answers yet, okay? We do need some approval, we need some endorsements from you, and we don't have every single logistic worked out. We're trying to move this project along quickly so that we have, um, if people want to participate in this um, Veterans Banner Program um, and uh, recognize a veteran in their life, they could do that like for, as a Christmas present. So we kind of are trying to move this along quickly. and. I have to first thank um, this, the Community Service Board and Mark Miners and Dan Wires for pulling together a kind of a quick um, Community Service Board meeting that happened at 6 o'clock tonight and we got the, the approval to move forward with this and so now we need to take it to this next level. I'm not going to tell you too much more about it because I really want the kids to talk about
about what it is, but I, and I don't know if the people at home can see. Can, can we hold up the? There's uh, there's a band here that uh, Commissioner T uh, Talentino's. I think um, I think that one is worth noting for the people at home to see that we've used um, Commissioner Talentino when he was what you say 17 years old and entered into the Marines. Um, so this is a, I think it's, it's such a win-win, win-win project for everybody. There's just so many benefits to it. But um, so as you ask questions, and I hope you do, we may have the answers. We may say we don't have the answers yet, but we're going to work on it. And we certainly want to take some feedback at our Community Service Commission or Community Service Board meeting earlier today. Um, we had some good feedback from the participants, things maybe we hadn't thought about, like if a, if a veteran is still alive, um, say Commissioner Talentino, we might need to get your approval before we hang a banner up. So something like that that we hadn't thought about. So we, we certainly want the feedback, but we're hoping to get your approval and your endorsement so that we can continue to move forward with this. So with that, I'm going to have each of the kids introduce themselves. And then I believe Kayla is going to be, so maybe she'll do it last and introduce herself, but she's going to talk about the program. But we're, we'll start over here with Isabel. Um, my name is Isabel Perrin, and I'm a senior at Sioux Area High School. Hello, my name is Danielle Price. I'm also a senior at Sioux Area High School. Hello, my name is Triton Johnson. I'm also a senior at Sioux High. I'm Emily McCackney, and I'm also a senior. Hi, I'm Kayla Wilhelms. I'm also a senior from the local Sioux High YAC group. We aren't just a group of seniors, there are juniors involved as well. We try to bring as many people as we can into our group just to make it a nice diverse group. Um, we're here today to essentially pitch you the veterans banner idea we came up with, which we think would be a huge benefit to our community in many ways while raising money for our service trip that we would like to take. We're we are pushing for Tanzania as Deb has explained and we would be actively involved with their elementary school, helping their students, and with this water filtration system, which we think would be an amazing thing to do. What we are doing, we would like to commemorate the many veterans from all the branches that are from our very own community and creating and displaying unique banners that feature them. Each banner would display an image of the veteran, branch of service, years served, and honors received, if any. These are the example banners you can see. Um, the banners would then be displayed around the community on lamp posts to line our city streets. Our plan is to sell each of these banners for $175 each, which would cover the $50, $50 to produce and the brackets $50 to purchase and the remaining $75 to go towards our group. And also an idea that came towards us was also giving back money to our, act to our veterans. And so if we do exceed the amount that we need, we would love to give back to our veterans as a thank you. Our plan, we have been reaching out for volunteers and we have met with Cloverland twice and they are very supportive but have a banner policy as well and we hope to meet with them the first week of January to get a decision but they are in huge support, just a matter of making it work. Also DTE was supportive with assisting us with their volunteers as we met with them as well. We also met with the Bay Mills tribe and the Sioux tribe and they are very supportive. Sioux tribe even gave us, opened a, showed us a grant that we could apply for, the Quaden CARES, yeah, the Quaid and CARES grant, which is a lot of money that could help save us money. So I think we have, we have a website here we'd like to show you. Hold up. Okay. So this website was made through a volunteer, which is great, saving us money. Um, it is fully ready to go. It has a form. This is a form. If you were to purchase a banner, this is what you'd fill out. It shows your email address, uh, your bio, branch, any tribal affiliation, and where you'd like it displayed. As we have YAC groups, not only in the Sioux, but we have them in Brimley, Rudyard, and Pickford, which Abby is also advising. So we would have those displayed, commemorating all of them, and the purchase price at the end. We also have, this idea is kind of snowballing and we created, we had an idea of QR codes and which you guys have in front of you, uh, example one. And if you were to put your phone up to it, 
right now you could just put your phone, your camera on it and then you'd slide up and it'd bring you to um, the, yeah to this website and on the website there there will be like bios of each banner so if you wanted to now you could and then these are, are the pencils? like a video that would you got them all. <laughs> Thanks. I thought I had one for I thought it was one for all of them. So which one's that for? Do you have to have, a, you First, have to have an iPhone? What? Do you have to have an iPhone or any phone? It should work, work with any phone. Yeah, any phone should work. And what will happen is once you scan it, right at the top of your screen, a drop down box will come for a web page. You click on that and it'll bring you to this page. Oh, okay. Uh, prob yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hold on. And also with this QR code, it would be. So if you're walking by it, you could go straight up to it. So it'd be in the lower part of the pole where you could do it. And it, we want to make it maybe as a design, like a freighter or something, just to make it look nice. So that's something we're working towards right now. And this video that we're about to play is for the John Quinn poster. John Quinn was born in 1892 in Canada. He married his wife, Eva Jacques, and had five children. He was a baker all of his life at his brother's bakery which is located where Austin Oaks is today. It was once called Quinn's Bakery. He served in World War I from 1914 to 1918 in the Army. He died in 1965 here in Sault Ste. Marie. You can read John's letters to his wife, Eva, that are on display at the Sioux Historical Society located at 115 Ashman Street. The 15 letters written while he was away at World War I turned 100 years old on December 18th, 2018. So our slogan behind this is history of hometown heroes told by hometown heroes. This video right now was spoken by Abby just because we didn't have time. But we, the essential idea is to have the students, the YAC students, be the ones speaking about these veterans. So that it would be like a nice involvement. And also with um, tourism, how you could create, this could be a huge tourist attraction with the whole idea of interactive history and being able to go around the city and how in that video it described going back to the historical society. And so then you could, it gives the exact address and you could go there and maybe read those letters that it described. Yeah, just. <laughs> There's another video we have for the other poster. For those that um, know Sharon Jones, which I think a lot of you do, this is actually Sharon Jones, which is five years old with her father, um, hmm. who was at Pearl Harbor when he was bombed. Or when he was bombed, when it was bombed. He wasn't bombed, but, um, and this is read by Sharon. John W. Burt was born in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan on January 17, 1914, the oldest of 13 children. He is pictured here with his daughter Sharon while he was home on furlough in 1943. His wife, Pearl Wise Burt, passed away in 1938 during childbirth and subsequently he enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps in 1939. He was assigned to the 3rd Defense Battalion Marine Fleet Force in 1940 and was stationed at Pearl Harbor when the Japanese attacked in 1941. From August until December of 1942, he participated in the landing assaults on the British Solomon Islands. As a result of these successful battles, he was given a citation from the President of the United States for demonstrating outstanding gallantry and determination in successfully executing forced landing assaults against a number of strongly defended Japanese positions on Teluji, Givutu, Tannenbogo, Florida, and Guadalcanal, completely routing all the enemy forces and seizing a most valuable base and airfield within the enemy zone of operations in the South Pacific Ocean. In December of 1943, he was transferred to the First School Communication Signal Battalion in California, 
where he completed training and was promoted to Tech Sergeant Communication. This began a lifelong interest in the operation and use of ham radios. In July of 1944, he was promoted to Master Technical Sergeant. He was transported back to the active battles on the islands of Tinian, Guam, and Peleliu in the Pacific Theater aboard the ship General E.T. Collins as a radio chief. He remained in the South Pacific area until the end of the war and returned to the United States on the destroyer USS Walkie in October of 1945. Upon returning to civilian life, he married Margaret Simonson from New Zealand and had three children, Catherine, Roy, and Tony. They settled in Burlington, Washington, where he utilized the training he received in the Marine Corps, opening his own business, Ducap Electronics. He was an active member of the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association and served on the Civil Service Commission of the City of Burlington. He passed away in Burlington, Washington on April 28, 1995. So this idea has kind of expanded a lot from just a banner program to something much bigger. And with this QR code as well expanding, we believe we could create an app ourselves, which is free, I believe. And if other cities would like to mimic this, they could download our app and then it would bring us, it'd bring them right back to the idea that Sault Ste. Marie created this. It'd be such a big impact, I believe. And so our goal is to have a launch date of Memorial Day 2019, hanging them year round for about three years as, as that seems to be a banner's lifespan. Um, thanks to CCCF, they said any weathering damage, such as a snowstorm or something that were to happen, they would love to replace it with their money. So, so the banners would still look nice because we don't want a bad banner hanging up representing our veterans. We're exploring the possibility of working with the Sioux High welding class and Mr. Rambo for student-made brackets, which would, be a, which would be great as more students would then be involved, and it would be saving us a lot of money from buying the brackets, which are pretty expensive. We want to do this because it creates many benefits to our community. As a community, we would be showing support to our veterans of the past, present, and future, giving us the freedoms and liberties we enjoy, and who at least I believe don't get too much attention when they really should because they do such a great thing for us. This would add beautification to the city, create placemaking by our idea of putting maybe the Coast Guard banners in the Coast Guard place and their area and the army and the army and then just like creating placemaking so you know where to go. Attract tourism with an interactive history lesson within our city. Create an opportunity to get kids involved with great projects like this rather than, rather than other things and hopefully some, something other cities would like to mimic for their community. Any questions, yes. concerns? Um, <laughs> I'm sure there are tremendous. many. Um, I mean, and again, it's not, a, it's not a city function, it's a Chippewa County Foundation, mm -hmm. NAC function. Um, Abby Baker is Abby Baker when she's with you, when she's with, behind the table, she's Commissioner Baker. So it, it's, it, we don't want, because we've had, other problem before people have a lot of expectation when the city gets involved and we had uh, folks having um, housing programs uh, on their own and it wasn't um, so that this is strictly um, uh, Abby, Commissioner Baker, yeah. Abby Baker um, helping you do your thing and um, I, I think I, I speak for the commission, it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a great project. There's certain steps that um, you're going to find that you're going to have to do in order to, to be really successful. but. <coughs> Just hearing the information on the um, on the tool you you provided, um, there's a lot there's a lot ahead of you, and and and, and I'm certainly not a, not a, anywhere near being a, a computer and and all the media outlet uh, literate type of thing. But um, when you hear that, there's some real possibilities. I don't know if the city logo should be on something that you're doing. Uh, it's nice that you involve the city. Um, you know, we're the oldest city settlement in the Midwest, so it's, um, and we have a lot of veterans organizations here uh, in, this, in this whole three county area, um, heavily um, involved in, in different um, wars and, and um, a lot of uh, folks that have passed on. Um, it's a tremendous, tremendous uh, opportunity for you. Commissioner Twardy. Thank you. 
Yeah, I always say whenever you want to get great ideas, you always put kids in charge of it because you guys are always the most creative. Uh, I do mimic, and they know, I, I said this in the Community Services Board meeting, I am very concerned about the City of Sault Ste. Marie logo being on anything uh, I, because this is a self-pay banner project. You don't want people to think that they were left out of something um, by the city. So uh, I think that we have to be very careful there. Um, but I, I like the banner program. Um, you know, I, I think that anytime you guys can learn uh, philanthropy and, and especially like going around the world, seeing other areas of the <coughs> world, it really it broadens your eyes to how lucky we are here at home. So uh, kudos to you for that. So I, I would be in support of this program. I'm, I am concerned about placement. I'm concerned about, um, you know, in the DDA because the, the DDA is, is the downtown business owners. So we have to be very careful that we're doing what the downtown business owners want to do. And um, so speaking on behalf of Justin Nepper saying that when he hasn't received input from the downtown business owners, which I, I own several, so, um, you know, so we have to be very careful there and not saying that that's where they will be. Abby? Um, I, just to comment on that, we had planned on presenting at the DDA meeting um, last Wednesday, but then it got rescheduled for this Wednesday, so we will be bringing it before uh, the DDA uh, this Wednesday. And um, speaking with Nepper, we they don't have, they have intentions on a banner program for restaurant banners and such, but um, none have been purchased. There's going to be some time in there. and. Um, we would utilize every other poll, so to speak, or whatever, basically whatever it boils down to, whatever they allow, whatever NEPR allows us and says we have 10 polls downtown you can use, that's how many we have downtown. Um, the purpose of the downtown tour is a virtual, hands-on, interactive history lesson of our community told through our local vets. Um, we're working with Susan Puska, who is originally from here, but she works for the government in veteran affairs. She's been taking um, uh, Vietnam uh, stories from local vets, and we got in touch with her. She has amazing information to share with us. Uh, we've already gotten four or five emails of uh, Vietnam vets. So uh, working with her, along with the DDA, and all of the other entities together, this could be a, a project mm -hmm. that really puts us on the map. I guess the question I have is uh, someone that can't afford the $170, uh, I mean, a lot of family, veterans, uh, yeah. you know, is there, is there, I know, is there some kind of a mechanism that would be, they would be taken care of, especially if they passed away? Yeah, so we were thinking if we were to have, um, going through the polls and finding out how many we could have, we would put aside maybe like 20, 25, where we, our group, would fundraise for those people that maybe can't afford it. And then we would help them, and we'd put their banner up as well. Okay, that's, and that's going to take some research on, on your part. Yeah, think, yeah. But, um, and I, you know, Lake State has banners that they need up because that's uh, Lake State is, uh, you know, trying to make sure people understand where they're where they're at. So um, banners have all kinds of um, uh, reasons for hanging. You know, so it's a matter of coordinating all of that. So it's it's not an it's not an easy project, but it's a tremendous opportunity. Um, and I. I don't know how many polls we have in the community and how many are available, how many aren't. So um, what do you need from, from the commission tonight? What are, you, what are you asking, I guess? We need permission to put them on city polls. Um, we're working with Cloverland. We've had two meetings with them. We're hoping to meet with them the first week of January. As you know, um, they're looking on hiring their new CEO. Um, they'll be doing that that first week. Hopefully we can jump on that same meeting and get it approved through them as well. Um, but we'd like to start with the city polls, and we just need your approval to put them on. We've done these banners um, here that you can see are to the spec that of the city's banner policy, so they're two by four, essentially. However, as we were discussing at the community services uh, board meeting, the blue lamp posts downtown are much smaller than mm -hmm. yes. a huge telephone pole. So we would have to do a smaller version on those bluer ones to otherwise it would take up half the so we're, we're gonna make sure that we get approval from the DDA and everything before we come back and hang up um, we just need the approval from you guys to uh, start working with them on that and figuring out where how many 
and what we're allowed to sell so we can the biggest reason we're pushing through this is because it's the holiday season sure. and it's the end of fiscal year for a lot of people and these are great Christmas gifts uh, for your loved ones so we could start uh, selling them and again they wouldn't be hung till May uh, for Memorial Weekend Lodge. Okay. Questions from the Commission? Uh, Commissioner Gary. I'm assuming the uh, Planning or uh, Community Services Board passed it. And then also uh, just a question under the uh, banner policy. It says the city manager has discretion to approve all the graphic designs, uh, determine placement, <coughs> and approve the placement of the banners. So I'm assuming we're following that guideline directly. City manager. Uh, thank you for that question, Commissioner. That would be correct. The motion in front of the city commission would be to approve the request submitted by the foundation uh, youth advisory committee subject to the administrative discretion of the city manager. And so because of the scope of the project, uh, the banner policy isn't necessarily 100% uh, natural fit, but uh, that motion does it comport with a similar thought process, which is that it would be subject to the discretion of the city manager. Anyone else? Uh, Commissioner Talentino. Uh, as Kathy, or as Commissioner Chordy has stated, I think this is a great program. I think this is going to be something that's going to be really cool and really neat to the community. Uh, as a living veteran, uh, the only thing that, and it, this is me, this is a concern that I have, I just kind of wish Yak would do something in the United States. You know, I realize everybody wants to go ahead and see the world like that 17-year-old kid did down there on the floor. But I think there's a lot of cool things you could do in the States, okay? And I think veterans will, would, would appreciate that, okay? Just food for thought for the future, okay? And we, we will be doing other, we have a whole list of local community fundraising projects that we're going to be in, integrating with other local organizations that we can donate to throughout the year. So all, throughout all the fundraising that we do, a portion will go to the kids in their trip, but a lot of it's gonna go back to the community. Just to address that, Tim, or Commissioner Talentino, this is, the service trip is just one of the service projects that the YAC students do. We've done many things from um, uh, doing a clothing drive for the Diane Pepler Resource Center. The kids have served lunch at the soup kitchen. They've prepared, um, or like did all the Christmas wrapping for them. We did a toiletry drive for the homeless teen program. The kids just on Sunday adopted a family a Chris for um, Christmas. Uh, so the service trip is one aspect, one piece of all of the service work that the students do and it really is to create we live in a global world now many of these kids um, probably will be serving working in another country at some point so it's, it's just to really give them a very um, broad appreciation of what service work can be like and what it what it looks like and feels like in other countries so there there's plenty of other local service work that's done by the students commissioner uh Sorry. When when you actually make the banners, do you, they are they one at a time, or do you have to have so many ordered for them to start the run? Well, it's cheaper to get um, like a massive order, so we'd plan to make get all of our applications in and then make that big order. So the reason I ask is that obviously we talked about our logo not being yeah. on there, but on the other side, there might be somebody that would pay to have their logo on there, mm -hmm. right? Because I think you have four logos on there right now. Yeah. So. If is it is there a possibility mm -hmm. that you could do some sort of advertising on the bottom for like a local restaurant or somebody well and then you could use that same app right well i i like where you're going with this because we've we've thought of that um so the reason why we chose the four on the um mr mendelskin's banner there is because we need the city's approval for you know putting them on there and from a pr standpoint and with this integrative tourist history lesson, um, I just, from a PR standpoint, I thought that the city, the tribe, and Cloverland would all want to be recognized for making this happen. Um, the tribe, like Kayla had said, um, pointed us in the direction of the Quaid and Cares. We've applied for a $25,000 grant. 
they do want their logo on there so we have no problem um, putting that on there if the city has an issue with it we have no problem taking it off either we were just doing it because it was a partnership now where the other local businesses will come in is on our website we'll sell advertisement to those local businesses and then um, I don't know much about it but I'm learning quickly from my son and these kids um, the geocache and the Pokemon go and how they hide treasures within these QR codes so with purchasing advertisement on our website you as a business would be able to in, in put a embed a code within a code so to speak and so every tenth scan on a poll it's you just want a free coffee at bird's eye or you got 10 percent off at harmony health food or, and you can direct the tourists um kind of like how it with the history uh museum there if, if we lent those letters on and you can direct them there over the river museum or to the tower of history so again you're getting that local tourist um attractive integrative with a whole family could do this. Everybody's got phones. Um, and again, it's told through our local vets and through our stu students. So like Debbie said, it's a win, 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 win everywhere, um, in my opinion. There's definitely kinks to work out. Um, and by brainstorming and having these conversations, um, it helps us and it will guide us. And before we hang them or do it, we can always come back again. But we just really need the approval to that you will allow us to put them on the polls and we will start selling them and then we'll work out all the logistics in the next five months before May. Okay. Any other questions? Let's go Commissioner Talentino. Make sure we have a picture out there. <laughs> <laughs> Where would you like to this house? <laughs> <laughs> Pending City Commission authorization and discussion. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the request submitted by the Chippewa County Foundation Youth Advisory Committee subject to administrative discretion of the city manager. Support. It's been moved supported. Questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Mayor Bosman? Yes. Commissioner Baker? No, she yes. didn't. I know. Abstain. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Okay. okay. Item number uh, G is the uh, city manager's report. We just give them a chance to, uh, you, you folks can. Uh, you have to stay for the rest of the meeting if you don't like. You know, <laughs> thanks for coming. You weren't talking to the commission. No. Or anyone else. Thank you. Okay, city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Item A under the city manager's report would provide for the award of a bid for the purchase of a new ambulance. On this matter, Chief Labani will present to the commission. Okay. Evening, Chief. Good evening, Mayor and Commission. Uh, as you're all aware, on June 4th of this year, the Commission approved for the application of funding through the USDA, uh, which was soon after won uh, with $80,850 earmarked towards the purchase of a new ambulance. Since receiving word about the grant award, a great amount of research was put into supplying a spec for a Type 1 ambulance, which the department has never operated. <laughs> The reason for switching uh, from a Type 3 ambulance, which is currently in use by the department, to a Type 1, uh, mainly due to man manufacturers no longer supplying chassis uh, for the Type 3 ambulance or the cutaway chassis. Um, the other reasons for this are the amount of room in the patient compartment uh, and, and, and many other reasons. Um, Lastly, uh, another big reason to switch to this type of chassis would be the ability to have a, a four-wheel drive ambulance would be the first one that our department's ever had, uh, which can prove to be uh, quite a, a huge improvement uh, just due to getting stuck in snow and some of the alleys and, and whatnot in town. 
As I'm sure you've noticed, new ambulances have become, have become more expensive. Reasons for the increased uh, cost in ambulances across the board compared to the last time uh, city bids were sought are many. Type 1 ambulances are consistently higher in price due to, being, due to having a more expensive chassis with upgraded suspension and squatting features, which means uh, when the ambulance gets to wherever its call is, the, the suspension actually lowers down so they can get the cot out of the back. Um, not only that, uh, but some of the, the bigger prices have to do with updated federal DOT safety standards, which mean more lights, more decals, and, and whatnot. And finally, uh, the, the newer diesel emissions um, with, the, with the addition of the Ward diesel filtration system. On November 7th, 2018, a bid opening was held at the city clerk's office for a type one ambulance for the fire department. Three vendors submitted bids with a total of three ambulances for consideration. The bids ranged from custom-built units to the basic, very, very basic entry-level ambulances. It's no surprise that none of the ambulance bids were exactly to department specifications since technology and safety uh, updates so quickly, even from just last year, uh, making our old spec <laughs> obsolete. The highest bid came in at $257,936.57 uh, for a 2019 wheel coach, and the lowest bid submitted was for $218,464 for a 2019 stock ambulance, uh, which uh, actually strayed quite a bit from what the department advertised. Uh, there were options for upgrading, however, those uh, price options were never included in the bid. Um, over the years, the fire department's had a lot of experience of knowing which brands work in, in the UP climate and which brands don't hold up, so this was also a factor in making the decision. The remaining bid, or bid, what we call bid number two, was for $248,580. It's not the cheapest quote submitted, but it's also not the most expensive. Um, that bid came in from r and r fire truck repair out of northville michigan uh, for a custom built to order type 1 lifeline ambulance on a 2019 f450 chassis with a diesel engine for what it's worth this is the same company we purchased our last ambulance from and we've been very very happy with it um, lifeline's bid included build specs which meet which met or exceeded the departmental specs advertised the warranties for the Lifeline Ambulance include five years, 60,000 mile warranties for the conversion, a 10 year, 100,000 mile warranty for minor and major electrical problems, not to mention excellent warranties for paint and hardware. Like the city's last ambulance purchase, one of the most appealing factors for choosing this vendor is the fire department has been satisfactorily utilizing r and fire truck repair for all of our fire truck maintenance and repair services. And again, they've done a fantastic job with that. It's, it's good to have a, uh, somebody that we trust uh, to be able to come in and, and do the work that's needed on these ambulance. Uh, it's well without a doubt that the custom built Lifeline Ambulance from R&R Fire Truck Repair will serve the city of Sault Ste. Marie in the safest and most cost efficient manner while causing the first fewest amount of breakdowns in the long run. Lastly, it should be noted the, update, the updated local match is an increase of $9,800 over the contribution from the, ga from the gaming fund approved at the, at the September 4th uh, meeting. Uh, more options are being explored to as assist in covering the matching funds. However, in the meantime, the remaining balance will have to be funded from the gaming fund. And I just also want to add lastly uh, that um, part of this, of this price uh, for this ambulance also includes a $14,000 electric hydraulic cot, so, um, which we did have budgeted out of a separate budget, so we can actually eliminate that, that cost from the other budget line. Uh, in order to approve this, I believe uh, two motions are going to be needed. The first one would be a budget revision in the amount of $9,800 from the gaming fund, and the second would be uh, for the purchase of the ambulance from r, &R Fire Truck Repair. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, City Manager? Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for that presentation, Chief. Uh, just a few notes. I know that the Fire Department and <clears throat> Fire Chief has put a significant level of research into this purchase, uh, the purchase that would best serve patients. And uh, as the Chief mentioned, for example, the hydraulic cot, a number of features inside of the ambulance which help uh, render excellent care. I uh, appreciate the opportunity from the USDA grant in excess of $80,000 to defray approximately uh, 30 to 35 percent of the costs 
And with the fleet being modernized within the past two to three years, uh, we've seen a decrease in our maintenance costs, which is positive for the general mm -hmm. fund budget. Excellent. I Thank see you. you mentioned USDA. Commissioner Geary. Question for the uh, city attorney. Since the uh, company I work for, USDA, has provided some of the grant funds for the purchase of this ambulance, and I had to uh, abstain from that transaction, uh, do I need to abstain from this? I think you should abstain on all sides of the transaction. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Twarty. Thank you. I just have a question, and then I'd like to make a motion. Um, so I don't know if this question is for the chief or for the city manager. Are we in just increasing our stock, or what is to be done with, are we cycling in a new ambulance and then cycling out and selling an old ambulance? I would defer to the chief. I know the answer, but he's very eloquent. <laughs> no problem. Uh, there is a, a trade-in included with this deal, so we would there be getting, we would be rolling stock through. Okay, thank you. And one more um, note about the $14,000 hydraulic cot. Not only does it make it more comfortable for the patients, but it protects our employees. Absolutely. Uh, because yeah. I know that they really assist with lifting. Absolutely. So. A lot of, lot of back injuries will be saved. Correct, with that. yeah. Uh, that being said, I would like to make a motion to approve a budget revision of an additional $9,800 for a total local contribution of $160,000 from the gaming fund. Support. 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 It's been moved supported. Are there any questions? A roll call, please. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Torty? Yes. Mayor Bosmus? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Motion carried. Uh, Commissioner Turney. Okay, there. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to award a bid for a new Type 1 ambulance to r, &R Fire Truck Repair for a 2019 Lifeline ambulance in the amount of $241,758. Support. Support. The move supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Torty? Yes. Mayor Bosmus? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item two, under the city manager's report, would provide for the award of a bid for audio-visual equipment for the city commission chambers. On this matter, IT Director Raffaele will join us at the podium. Oh. You I'm, ne I'm never out here. No. <laughs> Sheesh. I don't like being out here. I like being back there. <laughs> Okay, so um, for the last couple of years, the City Commission audio video equipment has become unstable. Sometimes I can't turn it on. Sometimes it doesn't record, and I'm back there panicking. Uh, the current equipment was purchased around 2009, 2010. Uh, the equipment um, was top, the top of the top then it actually is uh, equipment that you would use in an actual recording studio so I mean it was top line stuff so um, it's been on my radar for capital project uh, this is my last capital project for a long time but um, so in August of 2018 uh, I I knew what I wanted for equipment but I, I didn't know how to put it all together so I um, I decided to meet with a uh, consultant and um, he wrote up the specs and everything that he came here and, uh, and informed us on what we needed. Um, some of the things that we'll get is um, replace all these cameras in here to high definition cameras because these are not high def cameras. Um, change the cabling here to an HDMI instead of the old uh, ancient uh, VGA cables. I will have control over the microphones. Currently, right now, I have no control over mics. So if Ms. Commissioner Talentino speaks louder than Commissioner Twardy, I can't tweak it. And with this new equip equipment, I'll be able to do that. So Wait a minute. Wait. I want to control the mics. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, know, I can't yeah, just, wait to go mute, yeah, mute, yeah. mute. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you won't see me poking my head around the corner going, yeah. somebody's got their mic on. Mics. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, with this new equipment, I can run it from, uh, from the back <laughs> with an iPad if I wanted to sit out here. And, and, and control it. But the, really the big part of it sure. all, um, yeah, we're gonna get better, um, high quality, nice picture equipment, but it, 
the time that it takes me to edit the video and uh, get it all put together and then into one big file and then get it up on YouTube, every commission meeting, depending on how long the commission meeting is, it can take anywhere from three to six hours for me to edit. With the new, we're gonna be live streaming on YouTube for one thing, so you'll have cable and and the live streaming on the internet. And it's, it's supposed to record right to the internet. So you're taking away those three to six hours that I spend not answering my phone, <laughs> editing video for the meeting. So that's that's a huge thing for me is, is that part of it, um, other than the nice quality picture and everything we'll get. But um, anyways, an RFP was posted on the city web uh, webpage and bids were open on November 26, 2018. We had two bids come in. Uh, the lowest bid was ASG uh, in the amount of $59,985. So it is my recommendation that the, you authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with ASG in the amount of $59,985 for audiovisual equipment for the city ch uh, commission chambers as presented. Right. Any questions? Hi, Dad. <laughs> city manager? You told me to say that. <laughs> I know that Director Raffaele touched on this, uh, the significant level of savings in staff time we anticipate over the lifetime of this equipment uh, that the value would approximate the cost of the equipment. So there's certainly a return. And I know that the improvements that the director has put into place, this is a department, the IT department, used to have two and a half positions, and now it's Director Raffaele. Mm -hmm. So certainly these kind of improvements uh, help the organization overall. Okay. And of course, with this providing public access information. I Thank promised you. I would build the network so it would be easy for one person to, to um, take care of, um, and then I'll retire. <laughs> 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 and this is my last piece. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Baker. Yeah, I just want to say I'm excited uh, for this. Lots of public comment of how to live streaming and why we weren't there yet. So it's I'm really excited for it. And with that, I'd like to make a motion to authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with ASG in the amount of $59,985 for audio visual equipment for the city commission chambers as presented. Support. It's been moved, supported. Are there any questions? <coughs> Roll call, please. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Mayor Bosmus? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. And you know what I'll be doing Thanks. tomorrow for a few hours. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. Item three under the city manager's report would provide authorization to waive the bidding process and extend 2018 contract prices for 2019 pavement marking activities. On this matter, City Engineer Basista. Evening, Linda. Good evening, Mayor and Commission. Good evening, Mayor and Commission. Mm -hmm. I got turned off. Okay. Um, PK Contracting sent us a letter last month indicating that uh, they'd be willing to hold their bid prices from last year's for pay, our annual pavement marking contract. PK Contracting has been the sole bidder for the last couple of years, and their 2017 prices were, uh, or 2018 prices were good, and, and so in anticipation of a possible rate increase, I'd like to for you to consider waiving the bidding process for the 2019 annual pavement markings and allow us to execute a contract with PK Contracting, uh, holding their bid prices from the 2018 contract. Uh, any questions? Uh, city Manager? Uh, thank you, Mayor. This is uh, an item, as is customary with this type of situation, in which uh, to waive the bidding process, a unanimous consent must be obtained from the City Commission upon the recommendation of the City Manager. And as uh, City Engineer has indicated, uh, it would not be beneficial to obtain sealed bids due to the fact that there are anticipated cost increases uh, combined with the lack of previous bidders and the uh, experience of the company as well as the price holding for 2018 price levels. Uh, it would be my recommendation that the City Commission waive the sealed bid requirement in this instance. Thank you. 
Okay, so there's two motions. Uh, let's go to uh, Commissioner Gary. I make a motion to waive the sealed bid requirement and authorize the city manager to enter into a contract. No, uh, to win, oh, two, two separate, bids, okay. Yeah. Just to I make a motion to waive the sealed bid requirement. Support. It's been moved and support. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Bosmus? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Motion to authorize the city manager to enter into a contract with PK Contracting using unit pricing from their 2018 contract. Support. It's been moved supported. Uh, questions? None. Roll call, please. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Torty? Yes. Mayor Bospis? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item 4 under the City Manager's Report would provide approval for the Ani Osborne Campground amended budget, the 2019 rate schedule, and the reservation system agreement. On this matter, Director Wires will present to the City Commission. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps passing the buck, but <laughs> he good evening, back. Mayor and City Commission. A new for the Ani Osborne Campground, a new online reservation system was researched and selected. The MySites program through mobilerving.com. It's a very robust reservation system that will provide seamless integration with our currently utilized PSN financial gateway and the city financial system software, Clarity, which is through our finance department. Most importantly, the public will have the ability for the first time to book a site online and on a first come, first served basis, have the ability to book a popular waterfront site months prior to the actual visit. This new reservation system is also being utilized by the city of Petoskey and the city of Hancock. Both of these communities were contacted directly and vetted. They are thrilled to be utilizing the software and have mentioned that it has provided efficiencies and streamlined their own municipal operations as well. The professional services vendor was selected from detailed research and reputation to the campground and recreational vehicle community. One of our overall goals was to establish improved controls at the Anya Osborne Campground, and the online reservation system provides this. The recreation coordinator will begin working immediately uh, with assisting campers with reservations in preparing the park to open this spring. This is, with us uh, taking on this operation, is very, very important to us, and we do not want to miss one step in this process. Now, some of the commissioners may comment about the reservation program with the city of Petoskey and the city of Hancock utilizing the software uh, and with them being extremely happy with it. It's one of these where um, it was selected as a professional service through detailed research and both these folks uh, are very excited going into another year utilizing this. The people at my sites have been extremely helpful to work with. Currently, we have a minimum of two weeks startup to set up the system. It is, in the, it is in the process, and we're actually meeting on Wednesday with the folks on a conference call in finance department with the, the folks at the PSN. And the PSN is who works with the city now in our finance department for credit card payments uh, here at City Hall as well. So this would be set up to be seamless. Also attached is an amendment to the budget that provides additional cost center items to the general operational budget as we proceed with a partial operating year with the campground opening date of May 15th. And that's where we're basically saying from approximately the 1st of January right through till June 30, that's six months, half a year. So we're, we're gonna start uh, by hitting the ground running. You did get a chance to see a, a partial budget um, for that amendment for this uh, coming year. Finally attached is a 2019 rate sheet that provides the detail for campground fees, reservation fees, as well as the reservation policy and cancellation fee and policy. The new online reservation credit card fee of $8 will serve to cover the cost to the city for the reservation software, as well as the PSN financial gateway transaction fees. 
eight dollars is is very common in reservation systems uh, one other item that we have on the form that you folks did get is that we uh, offer the discount for the walk-in cash customers um, so that is something that we feel very strongly about so if there's local cash paying customers want to come in and take care of it that way um, we're excited to get this project going getting it underway and if there's any questions any questions uh, commissioner Twarney. thank you so uh so you're saying the online reservation fee is going to offset this eighty three hundred dollars eventually or what is it that you're the, saying the eight the eight dollar fee yeah if i get to the uh, to answer it correctly commissioner the eight dollar fee um there's a three dollar fee that is for the my sites for the software uh, that we would end up paying. So then the rest of that money th with that $8 would pay the PSN fee. Um, and that could range. Uh, that's what we're still no to working on. So it would fit that within that $5. Okay. And some may be more, some may be less, depending on if somebody signs up for 90 days. Okay. Say they, they pay so is this $8,300 then, is that an annual fee to RVing.com or? $8,300. Well, because I see a dollar amount for... 8300 correct on yeah. the my sites uh, uh well that's what we're that's what the budgeted source is tonight or the the dollar amount being requested that's what it says right here in our agenda eighty three hundred dollars is the dollar amount it's not budgeted and then saying that it's going to come from the city general fund that's what the yeah. no i don't know what that is Mine said, oh, 58,000. Oh, I thought that was a dollar sign. See, I need my glasses. <laughs> Here we go. So it's 58. Yes, the, the 58,300, <laughs> that would be something that would come out of the general fund temporarily okay. until we start to gain our revenue. I was trying to find that number okay. myself. Yeah, I was trying to until we start to, to bring in our revenues and immediately when the reservation starts the re the the dollars will be flowing in okay that was my question yep. then okay because i thought that eight thousand dollars i'm like is that an annual fee but it's a 58 no and in, <laughs> in in commissioner the 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 bigger item here is that we've never run this mm -hmm. so this is a for us to operate it and i think it's a very conservative start for us certainly we're going to watch the numbers we're going to keep an eye or keep an eye on that and certainly we feel very confident that the reservations are certainly going to make a huge difference yeah um, we've never, never i'm also a little concerned though there's a lot of people that start calling on january 1st they're so, calling now okay so they're calling now <laughs> they are calling now and it's going to be really difficult to figure out because if somebody books online that's immediate and then what do you do how do you backdate those phone calls how do you How's that? And that's not up to us to manage that. No. It's up to the city manager and you. But those are just some of my concerns. So. <laughs> no, I can I can answer a couple of those, Commissioner. Everything is going to be in uh, through the online system. If somebody walks into City Hall and they want to book one, we're going to work towards doing that. We may for some folks. We've already had a local person come in and said, I want to book a site. And they want to give us a check. And they don't do internet they don't do anything of that nature so we're going to work through recreation coordinator even uh, somewhere where the folks can give us the money we'll register them online and get that going there's going to be a little bit of a, a learning for some of this as well and one uh, caveat to that hopefully on wednesday when we meet with the people at my my sites and their psn um, we're looking they're not sure if we can launch on january 1st so to speak okay. And that's only just trying to tie the whole financial system and the reservations together. And I, the, our intent is if it's January 4th, if it's January 7th, I don't think we'd go beyond that. But sometime, and we're going to find out more on Wednesday, it may end up being a, a bit of an odd date, like January 3rd, so that we can launch everything. Our website, the city's website will change. That will go up. The, date, the dates will go up, and then we'll be ready to, to serve the folks. So it is exciting. Commissioner Baker? Um, I'm super excited about this. I think it's going to make the function of the campground and uh, your job a lot easier as far as coordinating all this. My question is, um, since this is kind of entwined with promoting the Polar, Malcolm Field, and Sherman Park as well, is there a way to integrate the system so you can take reservations for Sherman Park Campground or to rent the pavilion or ice time and so forth? The, that's a good question, Commissioner. One of the items that we're looking at almost uh, sometime over the winter, once we get this reservation system up and going for ANI, it's our intention to start working towards 
putting this to work for us as well, and we can do that for the Sherman Park campground. There's nuts and bolts and things that we've got to do to make it work, um, and also potentially even uh, the um, pavilion at Sherman Park. When it's getting into ice time, it gets a little bit more intricate with that, and that might be a little bit more difficult to do, um, but certainly it, this, this system is, in, and they do other things. So we're gonna work to expand and do those types of things, but this is kind of a, out of the chute, we're gonna make it work. A lot of, a lot of promising things. Uh, question for the city manager. So with that, by integrating those things down the road, you know, as we get one implemented and you go to another, we'll, is it just one flat rate and we get to use the system for multiple things or are we going to have to pay more money to this my whatever it's called my sites my sites All right thanks commissioner and i think it would be per transaction which it would be for the my sites agreement i do know that in regards to marketing uh i know that through this process you know, we know that first impressions matter with the city managing the campground and the Department of Public uh, Works and Recreation has obtained all of the contact information for people who have stayed at the campground in the past. So we intend to use that kind of contact information to reach out, send emails, send promotional uh, types of, of items in an effort to try to, you know, build up the brand of the campground further to generate those types of revenues aggressively market uh, the parks and recreation facilities. As part of the portfolio, whether it's reserving at Sherman Park or at a different facility, it would be per transaction, no. So we wouldn't have to do anything more to, than what we're doing right now to implement the other entities? And I think that may be true, but if city administration expands this into a different area of operation, we would return this to the city commission for authorization just to ensure that we have the approval uh, from city commission to expand it into a different area of function. Have, have you, has the city administration thought about, since you're doing Ani Osborne already and we control Sherman, right, as well. It's a different site. To put them kind of <clears throat> on the same website, would that be, you see what I'm getting at here? Right, I certainly I think our, our approach is to market all of our parks and recreation assets as a whole, uh, as a vibrant whole, which they are. And so that's certainly a possibility. I think it would be an, uh, an easy tie-in if you're doing it for the one to just add in the other, just a suggestion. Because um, I think online reservation, especially for the younger generation, that's kind of how they do things. And if you can tie it in right away, right? Yeah. Yeah. If, even internally, we've held discussions about do we research uh, mobile apps so that somebody who's staying at the campground will have access to information. Maybe it can integrate with uh, different kinds of services that will support their stay in the community. Great, thank you. Commissioner Collins. Thank you. When I'm looking at the uh, reservation and cancellation policies, uh, is that something that you guys researched? Commissioner, that's a very good question. I did research that, and that is very, very uh, boilerplate to the state of Michigan and so, what they utilize. And, I, and in one of my discussions with the folks in Petoskey, they're saying you need to have something in place um, because if you don't, it can get really out of hand. And I talked to them at length, and they said that they're adopting what the state of Michigan has. So I went to the state of Michigan's website, and pretty much what it is is the longer you hold a reservation, uh, the more you're holding it for them, and, and there's a percent that uh, you could hold a, a 90 day reservation for 90 days and someone gives it up at the last minute. So the city has to protect themselves, and that's all that that was, was so that it's a fair for the city. Um, so, with that, and I don't, obviously you've gone out to the Michigan DNR uh, yes. website, then, yes, sir, how Lake Burt Lake and Indian River and the, all those tie in together from that one site. The, to the Michigan uh, Department yeah. of Natural Resources is where I went. I didn't go to all the individual Michigan campgrounds. But if you go to that site, if you go into it, you actually click in and put in what campground you want to go to and what area. I believe so. So that's just to um, Commissioner Baker's point that it's a very easy tie-in because this is very similar. Um, the, and again, that's up to you guys. Um, the only thing that I was looking at on here that I haven't seen 
is the walk-in cash customer's charge of three dollars so i do a lot of marina hopping and it's basically a michigan dnr website and i've never seen anything where when i've gone into a slip of the marina or even a, a state park that they charge me a registration fee i mean i realize it's only three dollars but i don't know if it's something that you're going to get pushback on and then the other thing is is that you have reservations that are canceled on the same day they are created they're going to be assessed a ten dollar cancellation modification fee that doesn't really make sense to me because the way that that it, it's set up that i understand is that if you make the reservation you're charged the eight dollars for making the reservation and if you cancel the reservation you're still charged the eight bucks so are you saying here that you're going to be charged the eight dollars plus if you cancel it we're going to hit you for another ten or if it's a modification fee if we then it's staff involvement and that's partially why i believe that's there um in the, the walk-in cash customers of three dollars the answer to that one is because we're not investing in any software per de for the city that's where the three dollar fee comes in so every time whether it's a cash customer we don't want to lose that because we have to pay that but if they're a cash customer then there's no um, psn charges because you're not using the credit so and and i believe that once we get into the season once we get into the system there's gonna end up being some tweaks as well so we the the intention was not to reinvent any wheel but do um what a lot of other folks have been doing for a lot of years so hopefully that answers your question and, and if something's not quite working out we'll have to take a look at it uh, and revisit that i'm good with that okay thanks um commissioner gary make a motion to approve the amended operational budget online reservation system agreement and 2019 fee schedule for the Ani osborne campground support it's been moved forward. are there any further questions roll call please commissioner collins yes commissioner gary yes commissioner miller yes commissioner talentino yes commissioner twardy yes mayor bosmas yes commissioner baker yes motion carried thank you dan <coughs> city manager thank you item five under the city manager's report would provide approval for the property transfer for lake superior state university's center for freshwater research and education again city engineer basista again evening Linda. Uh, again, good evening. Uh, back in March, you uh, approved a uh, execution of a property transfer agreement with Lake Superior State University uh, to uh, for them to construct their Center for Freshwater Research on uh, existing Alfred Park property. And since that time, LSSU has been working uh, to get uh, their grant approval through the state and working with their um, consultant for, uh, to start design. So as part of the uh, site plan review and, and site planning, uh, it was we were working out what the boundary would be with, um, for, the, uh, for the site and also the location of uh, Salmon Runway. And I have the site plan uh, up. If, oh, it's up. OK. So. Um, for reference, uh, Portage Avenue is on the right-hand side of the site plan, and Waterfront is on the on the right. And this is uh, currently the parking lot area of Alfred Park. And the C-free proposed C-free building is is here with their um, parking lot, and then relocated uh, Salmon Runway uh, coming off of Portage is slightly shifted to the east from where where it currently is and would come through through the site and end currently in a type of cul-de-sac turnaround area uh, this as part of the construction uh, lssu would be building the first leg of the 10-foot bicycle um, or multi-use trail that would ultimately continue to the waterfront and extend along the waterfront and wrap around Alfred Park and then back out to the sidewalk on Portage Avenue. Um, so this represents, this picture represents what LSSU would be constructing as part of this project. Now, as you know, um, the uh, city also applied for Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund grant to make additional park improvements, which 
I believe that would also help extend the pathway and provide for uh, amenities, park amenities in, in this area. This, this area actually pushes the um, fence that's currently there to the east. Uh, this, this is the um, command and control command center, center building, the big large bathroom, <laughs> Alfred Park bathroom. Um, but anyway, uh, so the, the park uh, in parking would be in this area, shifted to this side of the park as opposed to being out in front. Um, the, the red line represents uh, LSSU's current um, property, proposed property boundary. However, in light of um, good chances that we're going to get the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund grant to you know, spend money, more money on the park, and uh, the next item, the uh, status report on the uh, build grant for doing the carbide dock uh, repair, then we know now that there will be city improvements on the city property. And so when we first started talking to LSSU about their boundary and, and so forth, even though we, we all agreed that, you know, as part of the agreement that there would be a shared um, responsibility and, and the whole site would be public, be considered public park, uh, we now know, you know, that we the city will be making improvements as well, and so I don't think LSSU has to feel uh, that they need to as much uh, um, area to to make improvements on for their site to be uh, attractive and aesthetically pleasing. Um, whereas before, see, they cannot spend any of their money outside of the property boundary um, that we are transferring to them. So all of their money, grant money, and their, their match has to be spent within their property. Um, so uh, that's why I think that the, the boundary was initially proposed as a little bit larger so that they just had a nice buffer around them for their, their improvements, make it look more park-like. But knowing that the whole area is going to be improved, I um, would, would like to push back the boundary that's uh, closer to the waterfront, push it back a little bit, push the boundary on the portage um, side to closer to their parking lot. Uh, it might mean some more turns and, and twists for their, for their actual um, property boundary, but um, that's what we'll be proposing. So the motion is, is for you to, in concept, approve the uh, site plan and, in general, the boundary, at least as a maximum boundary. And then we'll be working with them to narrow that down and, and reconfigure it a little bit so that it, it, it meets, <coughs> completely meets our needs, especially in, in light of our, the work that we will be doing on the waterfront. Um, and, and through the center of the site, I didn't say, but that will be a public road. Salmon Runway will continue to be a public road. So their, their property um, will uh, be on either side of Salmon Runway. Just a question I had uh, today, in fact, uh, Alfred Park will continue to be Alfred Park. What the C3 is doing is, is certainly tremendous and we're happy, but uh, once we're done, the Alfred Park will come back and uh, correct when and, and the improvements and we'll get to that here just shortly but um, okay hey, we need a motion uh, let's go to Commissioner Talentino sure uh, make a motion to approve the LSSU C free site plan and authorize the city manager and city engineer to finalize the property boundary <coughs> and to transfer the property to Lake Superior State University support, support. it's been moved support are there any questions roll call please Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Torty? Yes. Mayor Bossman? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Don't go far. <laughs> that concludes the city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor and Commission. Okay, thank you. Item H, the status report. Back to the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. First item under status reports is an update regarding the carbide dock repair and East Easter Day Avenue reconstruction build grant announcement. Okay, and before you start, we're going to have a couple of people come up to just say a few words. 
Um, we have with us tonight uh, U.S. Senator Gary uh, Peters, office person here in the UP, uh, Caitlin Rader, and uh, she's being followed up by our own uh, uh, former commissioner and, uh, of course, U.S. Senator Debbie Stabenow, um, uh, UP representative. These, they're both housed in the Marquette area. Someday maybe we'll get them over here in Sault Ste. Marie, but because Again, that's centrally located. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but they have just a few words and uh, thank you very much for all your efforts and certainly the Senator's efforts uh, and certainly uh, uh, Representative Bergman. Uh, we knew it took the whole, the whole contingency. So Caitlin, we'll let you go first. You can talk to us about it. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for having me here tonight. Um, so on behalf of uh, Senator Peters, I'd like to say congratulations to all of you in the city for the hard work that's been put in, the leadership that's been shown over many years of applying for Tiger and now Build, and congratulations on $20.7 million um, for this Build grant for this year to repair the carbide dock. This is really something special for the city, and um, in my opinion, it's a trifecta. So we have the new lock being built, we're gonna have the dock, and then we have the sea free so um, I know the senator is just so happy and um, really congratulations on all your hard work um, this dock is particularly important as it's a um, port of entry uh, the senator I'd like to note has just become the ranking member of the Homeland Security Committee um, so this is uh, something that he'll definitely have jurisdiction over and we're really looking forward to the new Congress and the senator's uh, new role and of course working with um, Senior Senator Debbie Stabenow and of course continuing our good relationship with Congressman Bergman and, and the city of Sault Ste. Marie. So thank you so much for having me here tonight and congratulations. Well, it's our pleasure, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Our well, friend Jane. Um, uh, to echo uh, my, the comments from my colleague Caitlin Rader, it's always uh, great to be back in Sault Ste. Marie uh, and to bring good news. Um, I think that uh, it goes without saying how important the carbide dock is not only uh, to the community, but to you know our long-term longevity, and, and certainly the senator um, knows the importance of quality, good infrastructure in Sault Ste. Marie specifically. Um, so it's it's tremendous to be here tonight um, to congratulate you on the build grant, um, to commend um, City Manager Basista for all the hard work, and, and City Manager Oliver Turner for all the hard work. And City Engineer Basista. And that's what I meant. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> Well, she might be after you know yeah, Oliver's. Yeah. Oliver had a slip earlier, so. Um, but it's 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 important to commend those who did a lot of the great work um, uh, on this project, and um, just to give you some context on these build grants, they're incredibly competitive. Um, we wrote on my office letters of support for I think uh, ten or twelve different projects across the UP alone, not to mention how many downstate, and only two in the entire state of Michigan were funded. Uh, the one here in Sault Ste. Marie and the one down in Berrien County. So I think it really underscores how unlikely it was that we would get this um, grant, but it's tremendous that we did. So um, I hope you guys understand. That. I mean, mm -hmm. you guys were up against it. And uh, when I first got the news, I was like, are you sure? Like, <laughs> double check that before I make calls. You know, <laughs> double check. Sault Ste. Marie, right? Um, so it's just exciting, uh, exciting news. And so. I couldn't be happier, and I just wanted to bring congratulations on behalf of the senator. Well, thank, thank you very much, Jay. Uh, and just keep the presents coming. <laughs> I, I, if, if I may, I did forget something. Sure. <clears throat> my colleague brought a memory to my mind. Um, so this was a very competitive process, and I forgot to, to say that the senator did have a chance to speak with Secretary Chow of the Department of Transportation before um, this award was granted. So. It was very competitive, and thank you very much for all of your work. Um, it, if it wasn't for your input that you had given me initially, then it would have been um, certainly not as easy to um, give my report, and definitely the senator um, relied on your information in order to speak with the secretary. So thank you again. That was it. Thanks. I just wanted to double back on that yeah. one before I forgot, because yeah. that is good. That is good. You all did so much good work, so thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Linda. And certainly thank Linda personally for all of her efforts. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I and I appreciate that promotion to city manager. <laughs> <laughs> no, I it it's very exciting that we received this grant. Um, it's a twenty one point seven million dollar project with a twenty point seven million dollar build grant. Uh, it's very exciting to receive, and, and uh, as 
Caitlin and, and Jay said, it was very competitive. Uh, there were uh, 91 projects awarded grants uh, throughout the United States out of 851 applications. And uh, I would say, uh, thank our senators, especially Senator Peters for personally talking to uh, uh, Secretary Chow because when uh, Angie Patterson and I were on a, the phone call with the Department of Transportation build grant debriefing representative from our Tiger grant, um, he gave us lots of tips and I actually sent a, a thank you to him uh, for, for his help in the debriefing, but um, he, he basically told us we had to have an in in Washington uh, for our project to be recognized. So whatever help we got from our, our representatives and our senators uh, absolutely helped us uh, get be one of the 91 out of 851 wow. <laughs> applications being uh, what a Christmas forwarded present, to right? <laughs> Chow, uh, Secretary Chow. So, uh, and it, it, we are one of 62 applications that are um, there are projects that are from rural communities and this year the build grants were um, there was more focus on rural communities so of course that helped us as well but also I would say an excellent application that uh, exposed the uh, importance of the carbide dock not only on uh, all of the transit uh, freighter transit that passes us but in support of the locks project I'm sure that uh, helped uh, with uh, get noticed uh, as far as our application and so I would like to thank um, uh, my in my office Angie Patterson uh, she has done an excellent job with all of our grants as far as helping me write them and, uh, and, and administering our grants. Um, I, I give one or two sentences and give the idea of what we want to say, and she's the one who writes it. Uh, and so I can't She's got a gift. thank her enough yeah. for her, her talents on, on uh, putting my two sentence, you know, concise thoughts into something that, you know, really is more interesting uh, for people to read. And, and, and the city so, manager mentioned that there's no cash match, which is another tremendous thing for us. That's correct. So the, the entire grant uh, is proposed with our um, uh, state special legislative grant that the state received and that was another aspect of of the criteria for the grant was how much non-federal funds were being committed to the project so that million dollar special legislative grant absolutely uh, was another component of our award so we're talking also about uh, i think this afternoon the manager and i were talking about the the front of the in front of the sea free and the public access and uh, the bike and trail um, is going to go down toward the water and then back back out. There'll be a uh, what do we call it? Would you say there was going to be a decking or boardwalk? boardwalk. Yeah. We'll actually see a so uh, the tremendous improvement. Yes. Yeah, so, the, so the plan at uh, one time before the sea free came through, our our study just looked at redoing the entire uh, dock face same from from east to west uh, but since the sea free came in and there's component of uh, water quality and and closer access to the um, to people to the water and and good habitat for for fish we are proposing that um, the portion in front of the sea free be just be a, a riprap a uh, armored shoreline so the uh, it would be a natural river shoreline uh, with a boardwalk over it for access for fishing and ship viewing. And then the um, multi-use trail will, as I mentioned during the Seafree uh, item, will come in off of Portage Avenue, loop around the Seafree site, and then back out into Portage. And so the, the park actually will be made bigger because we're proposing to shift the fence uh, further east. So the carbide, the, the maritime portion gets a little, little smaller, but 
still be adequate for the salt deliveries that I think that'll be our our uh, our outline for our footprint because we know what our needs are as far as salt goes and then uh, from there uh, make the improvements to the carbide dock and, and make it useful for uh, equipment on and off and and so forth so what that's going to look like remains to be seen because we have options to either um, based on our study that we did with the waterfront redevelopment study uh, we could uh, use uh, sheet piling and and make it a solid wall or uh, remove the existing concrete cap and put in pile piles that are there now and basically replicate the existing uh, dock mm -hmm. so okay. we'll be looking at that right away as far as making that selection on which route we go ask, uh, when's going to get started um, okay, so that's always a question <clears throat> so we have a lot of work to do yeah um uh, we have to go through the uh, federal environmental reviews and and get our preliminary and and design done and and execute the grant and um, we absolutely have to have our um, the grant executed by uh, September 30th of 2020, which means we need to be far enough along to have passed the uh, federal uh, NEPA reviews. And um, so I anticipate that we'll start construction in 2021. And let's not forget that uh, this grant also includes the reconstruction of Easter Day, and so we propose that in the grant is Easter Day is the truck route from the um, dock to Ashman and, and then out to the expressway. So um, we will um, be reconstructing Easter Day, and the grant also includes replacement of the water and sewer, which is much needed. So Good. the Easter Day component is about $4 million, and had we not received this grant, uh, my plan for December was how are we going to chunk up Easter Day in order to get that completed at some point in the next mm -hmm. five years. Mm -hmm. It would have had to been done in, in segments because the cost would just be too much to do uh, as one a single project. Curb, curb and gutter also? Replacing curb, and, yes. Curb and to curb, curb right now. and sidewalk that has yeah. not been. We replaced a lot of sidewalks yeah. in our sidewalk replacement program, but sidewalks will get removed because we'll be doing water and sewer services too. So it's okay. going to look a lot like our CSO sure. projects had looked people like. People asking about the sidewalks too. So yeah, so Excellent. we'll the sidewalks will get replaced, and uh, so yeah, we'll be making some a lot of inter, intersection improvements as well. Okay, a lot a lot to talk about going forward. So, uh, Commissioner Talentino. I'd like to include a roundabout <laughs> at Easter Day Avenue, Minneapolis. So let's yes. just keep that in mind, okay? Uh, I think that's, that's a great idea, Commissioner Talentino. I will definitely look into that. That is one of. I, I don't know if that just of, won me any fans, but that is, uh, one, of, that is one of Linda Bassist's yeah. dying yeah. needs right yeah. there. That's actually that is actually in the application. Yeah. So we we did. We'll see. Propose that in the application. Actually, uh, are, are we going to be reaching out to the Corps of Engineers for some expertise on their side of it? Is that something that, that we have thought into about well, reaching out to we them? We absolutely or? will be uh, discussing the Corps of Engi with the Corps of Engineers from the permitting standpoint and the um, the fact that it's the um, their channel shipping channel goes right up to the face of the dock. Okay. So there definitely will be Corps of Engineers involved. Great. Thank uh, you, Commissioner, yeah. Commissioner Baker. Uh, I just want to commend you and Angie and administration for all the work. Uh, there, I've heard nothing but exciting things, especially from the fishermen that have been dying to get back down there. So between this and the locks, um, I think the Sioux's poised to really mm. jump yeah, forward, and it's all because of the great staff we have. So thank you so much for all your hard work. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Gary. I was just going to echo the same uh, sentiments. I know this the carbide dock's been a topic of discussion for years and years and years mm -hmm. and years from the city commission, and uh, I know that uh, you've been working on the applications for a few years, mm -hmm. and uh, I think some of us were a little skeptical of the the dream of the bill grant because it looked a little bit uh, uh, far-reaching, but it, it it shows the importance and significance of the piece of property that we have, which is the carbide dock in that area. And uh, thank goodness that uh, you did uh, stick to it and uh, write the grant and uh, it was received. So 
uh, kudos to everybody that was involved and, and uh, lots of good things to come. Thank right. you. Commissioner Twardy. Everybody needs their minute. So yeah, again, thank you to you. And, uh, but I also want to say that I, I think it has to do a lot with a great legislative team. I really believe, like when we had the meeting on, I think it was primary election day with Jack Bergman, and then we know that we have Caitlin Rader and we know that we have Jay Gage who are constantly fighting for us. So I think it really comes back to building those relationships and we talk about that every year when we go down to the Capitol, how important, how important the legislative priorities are and that's how we got the million dollars in the first place is keeping those relationships and building those relationships. So knowing that we've got them fighting for us over in Washington. It, it really, really helps yeah, out. Absolutely. It, and, as and I no said, we no needed that. Part, the collaboration that exists in this community. Correct. With the amount of people that we have, like the Sioux Tribe, like the Corps, like others that are uh, the, uh, the boats that travel up and down and, and having that function, and they know that that's a, that's a dock that they yeah. need. Uh, yeah, the, we, like we had, we right. had uh, letters of support from uh, many of our partners yeah. and, and, and stakeholders in the carbide dock, and uh, we, without those, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, it all, would, it all ties it together, all tie working relationships together. With this, with, within the commission, within the community, within mm -hmm. the state, and within the federal. I mean, it Absolutely. all makes a great story, and it, it doesn't mm -hmm. work without it. Right. If, if you don't have it, you, it will never happen, you know, so. Yeah. No, it's great. Thank you. City manager, you want to say? I feel as nothing can be added <laughs> <Yeah>. to that. <laughs> Thank you. Moving on. No. <laughs> what do we got next? <clears throat> Thank you, Linda. Uh, second item under status report is the year-end report from the Economic Development Corporation. The year-end report? <laughs> <laughs> what time is it? <laughs> I know he's quick. I've got Sarah here, evening. our office coordinator. Evening, Good evening, evening Sarah. Commission. Thank you. And this is Sarah. She'll uh, keep me flowing here and uh, keep it brief as I can. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. 2018 was a, a wonderful year for us. And um, we've also in, included uh, and welcomed two new board members to our, um, to our EDC board. Um, we're pleased to have uh, many new businesses in our smart zone uh, in our EDC. Go to the next page there. Um, and uh, we'll uh, look forward to uh, um, helping them as well incubate, including several firms from, from Canada. And we've also um, faced many challenges in our local manufacturing, uh, including higher tariffs and, and duty rates. And uh, that's why we uh, applied for the expansion, as you know, of our foreign trade zone. Initial indications are that our application is flying through the system and uh, should be approved shortly. Next. Here's our mission, um, and I won't read it for you, but uh, uh, invest in the Sioux, and we'll invest in you. And here's our, our board members, a list of them. And, um, and I also want to thank uh, Commissioner Abby Baker for being our liaison. Um, I really appreciate it, taking your time for your incredibly busy schedule. Uh, this year in our smart zone, we, we uh, sadly said goodbye to the Lake State Simulation Center. Uh, we, they've been there almost, almost five years. But with, uh, with that came the opportunity to welcome several firms, Osprey, Norpro, Canadian Maple, Ideas to Production, and Cardinal Plumbing and Heating. Our revenue is growing, and that means we can fulfill more projects. And you'll see, uh, this is our projected uh, tenant, re tenant revenue for uh, 2018 is $80,000. And you'll also see some of the uh, firms that I've mentioned in the bottom um, and uh, in their uh, logos, and they are proudly displayed on our, on our front of our building. As you know, Sanderson Field, which is an important economic driver for our community, um, we did many, many improvements this year, and thanks to uh, Tracy Layton in our, in our office, um, uh, uh, archi architect of the, a lot of these projects, and uh, we really appreciate her efforts. And you'll see in the graph there, 985 flights with 2,200 passengers in this past year, and uh, which is pretty remarkable for uh, for our small airport. Uh, event schedule, I won't go into all those, but uh, you'll see that our, our building is uh, uh, quite busy, and our events are, are numerous, and uh, all of them take time and effort, but 
Um, uh, we're very proud of the um, progress we've made in each one of these, and we follow up accordingly. Highlights. I mentioned Sanderson Field with the runway and uh, improvements. Uh, the industrial park, our vacant lots are, have been surveyed, and uh, um, we are now certified by the state of Michigan as a certified business park, uh, the only one in the Upper Peninsula. So we're real proud of that, and next year we'll get the airport on that site as well. We, are, we were pleased to be a recipient of an E-Cities Award again this year by the University of Michigan Dearborn College of Business. Um, they awarded us with a, an award for the uh, uh, many things that we do in our community. Uh, they highlighted our Economic Resource Alliance, and um, we were one of four communities selected in the state of Michigan out of 277 applicants. So we're very proud of that, and uh, the award is proudly uh, being uh, displayed in our building. And this was a community-wide effort by all of our, all of our uh, departments and all of our our opportunities that we have. So uh, many thanks for that. We consolidated all of our banking this year, which netted us uh, $1,500 a month approximately in additional uh, revenue and saved tremendous staff time. We continue to work with Lake State, uh, not only in the um, President's office, but the Dean's office and the Product Development Center. And uh, we'll continue to help market that facility, which benefits our community tremendously. Um, let's see, As you'll see on page, on that page, uh, we've partnered with Lake State and we spoke at their open house on the Sim Lab and, um, and we've also uh, continued to meet with the Coast Guard um, and uh, in the integration committee and, uh, and also the uh, um, promotional efforts for that. You'll see on the next page, uh, we've had uh, uh, many, many numbers that, that fly around but um, the number that we uh, are, are very proud of, of course, are the grant funds that we've received uh, that never been received before and uh, something new for us. And uh, we're very, very pleased to have that $28,000 figure. Lots of challenges. Um, uh, opportunity zones uh, by the federal government. We're still learning on that. Uh, we will get more information as we, as we move along. Uh, the incubator um, project, uh, we're We've marketed our, our, our land uh, at the airport. As you'll notice, uh, there are for sale signs up there. No, the airport's not for sale, um, but the land in and around it is, mm -hmm. and uh, we've got some interest. Uh, we've listed not only with the multi-listing site, but Zoom Prospector, which is the official site of the state that looks for properties, and uh, um, we have got them listed on that as well. So we're very looking forward to that. Um, and you'll see some ending numbers here. Um, our manufacturing day, which was the largest event we'd ever had, and uh, we've had tremendous feedback on that. Um, we've joined the Eastern UP Board of Realtors, uh, the Twin Sioux and the Binational Project. Uh, there'll be more information coming on that, but we're looking to create a zone in uh, Ontario and Michigan uh, to offer free trade of uh, merchandise and goods. And uh, the Preliminary indications are we've got tremendous support on that as well. Briefly, that's that's it. Well, thank you very much, thank Jeff. You. Uh, you know, you have a great staff. Uh, you've been very busy. Uh, the free trade zone and, uh, and the marketing that we've been doing over in Sioux, Ontario, is is paying off. I mean, they're they're coming over and they're establishing businesses. And um, we know you've been been very busy in the. Um, the EDC complex. Um, I don't know. Do you have any more room to, to rent, or are you pretty full? We can find room. For just a, <laughs> <laughs> we always find a nook or a cranny. Uh, okay. Got some space that we have available. But, okay. um, Great. No, uh, good luck in the 2019. Um, looks like it's going to be a very busy year. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate Great. it. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Thanks for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item number uh, anything else, City Manager? No. Right. <laughs> Thank you for the Thank you, Mary. We're moving on, right? Okay, item I, matters presented by the public. Anyone in the audience that would like to make a comment at this time? Okay, hearing none, we'll go to J, matters presented by the City Commission. Let me just begin by talking about the uh, ball drop on uh, uh, Chris, or, uh, New Year's Eve um, at uh, 
uh, Island Books and Craft, uh, Les Townsend. Um, they happened last year, 2018. It was a great uh, ball drop, the first ever in, in the city of Sault Ste. Marie. This year we're talking about another ball drop, maybe a ship drop. I, I, can't, I, I know there was some, uh, someone asking about looking like a, a freighter you know, coming down the line, but that's going to go on again on, on New Year's Eve. And uh, we all gather in the corner, and it was a very nice time. And uh, the local businesses nearby uh, were the beneficiaries of, of before and after. So um, uh, just try and put that on your calendar. Also, uh, on behalf of the commission, I'd like to wish uh, the uh, public and certainly our staff and uh, those residents of the city of Sault Ste. Marie, a Merry Christmas and a, a very prosperous New Year. We know 2018 was, uh, you know, our 350th anniversary, and that, in fact, the ball drop is the final um, uh, 350th anniversary celebration um, that will conclude uh, the 350th anniversary uh, of the British settlement, that we, or, the, yeah, the, the French settlement that began here in 1668. So, um, we, we know it was very busy in 2018, and we were saying, and in 2019, looks like another banner year. Uh, everything we hear from uh, Linda Hoth and the Convention and Visitors Bureau, um, uh, they've got more uh, people involved in conventions and stuff coming into the city of Sault Ste. Marie and surrounding area. So we, we all benefit when, when the city of Sault Ste. Marie benefits, and um, outlying areas certainly uh, are, are part of that contingency. So uh, again, we're looking forward to 2019. And um, wish everybody a uh, very Merry Christmas and a, and a Happy New Year again. Thanks. Uh, Say it again. Oh, sure. Um, we had a, a celebration with the uh, City of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario Council and, and Mayor, and it was our turn to host. And again, I'd like to thank the Jeff Holt and the EDC for um, putting on that, uh, that uh, party for us. Uh, as the hospitality was tremendous. They, they appreciated it, and we certainly appreciate it. And, and it's their turn next year, and, and we're already looking forward to, to 2019 uh, over in the city of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. So, again, it was just a great event, and those continue to continue to build the relationships that we, that we have and endure. Um, we, we always have a good time, and now we're looking at maybe another meeting in the public. That would be the, the fifth meeting. Um, in the coming future, uh, we'll, I'm sure the staff will be working on that. Maybe not this year, maybe next year. So, anything else? Yep. We're good. Yep. Anyone else? Uh, let's go to S Commissioner Gary. I'll make a motion to adjourn this meeting. Support. It's been moved support. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. We are adjourned. Thank you.